Here's a controversial thesis. Virgil Abloh is a copycat. He's a plagiarist. He's an idea vampire. The thing is though, it might not matter. In fact, it might actually be a good thing, or at the very least, an understandable thing. But to some, it's an unforgivable sin. So let's dive in and see where we land. But before we get going, I've looked into it, and a very, very tiny percentage of you are actually subscribed to the channel. So it doesn't cost you anything. If you like the content I make, just click that subscribe button, and I thank you profusely. First, let's get familiar with all of the allegations of Virgil's theft. Most recently, drama heated up after the Belgian designer Walter van Berendonck accused Virgil of stealing his designs for Louis Vuitton's spring-summer 2021 show. Most of it was around these stuffed animals that adorned the pieces. Walter claimed that concept as his own, while Virgil cited an earlier Louis Vuitton collection. However, there were also some very, very similar sunglasses on display as well. But that was far from the first time Virgil has been through this circus of allegations. Just a couple months before the Walter drama, the artist Ryder Rips, who himself has a working history with Ablo dating back to the Bin Trill days in 2013, accused Virgil of stealing his original artwork for the cover design of Pop Smoke's posthumous album. This one actually caused such a furor that the artwork was later changed. But we've still got a long way to go. A lot of people have had their issues with Virgil. In 2019, designer Punk Zek of the fashion brand Colors, a small company, accused Ablo of blatantly ripping off their designs. Because Colors isn't that well known, this one didn't really get resolved. It just led to a Diet Prada post, a few articles, and that's about it. This next one may actually be the worst in my opinion. It's one thing to steal from a widely respected and celebrated Belgian designer, or even an up and coming fashion brand, but it's another entirely to steal from a relative nobody. In this case, an intern. This one hasn't really been fully investigated or discussed, but an intern that Virgil fired supposedly came up with many of the ideas that led to Virgil's blockbuster collaboration with Nike called The Ten. And then there are these smaller instances, the ones that didn't lead to a full drama cycle, but instead were made up of like single tweets or Instagram posts, you know, these little pokes and prods that never turned into a full on fist fight. For example, Kirby Jean Raymond of Pierre Moss tweeted and then later deleted, I can get mad all I want. In the end, he has millions more following that believe he did it first. This was in response to a fan posting side-by-side -side pictures of Kirby and Virgil's pieces. That's not the only time Kirby has called Virgil out. On the Netflix reality show, Next in Fashion, he openly stated, Louis Vuitton steals my designs. Virgil is the designer for LV, so that accusation is kind of crystal clear. Diet Prada also created a small stir when they posted about an off-white women's hoodie silhouette one that they saw as clearly inspired by the brand and real age who virgil did not credit finally the sportswear brand helly hansen went so far as to sue abloh for allegedly stealing their diagonal stripe design for the off-white logo they ended up settling this lawsuit but with the details of that settlement kept hidden there's no way to know exactly how it all shook out I could keep going all day collecting every accusation and gripe from every artist, designer, engineer, architect, whoever it may be, who has had their issue with Virgil Abloh. Abloh himself has kind of seesawed in his responses to this stuff over time. Sometimes he'll deny ever taking ideas from anyone else, and at others he'll cheekily reference someone like the artist Duchamp, who famously used existing everyday objects in his work. I think the truth is much closer to the latter than the former. Here's the thing, Virgil is smart as hell and knowledgeable. He's a sponge for fashion, art, music, really any creative discipline. Just watch any video of him speaking and you'll be blown away by how deeply he thinks about some of this stuff, very much in contrast with some of the public perceptions about him. An example that's been coming into my mind a lot as I've been working on this video has been a guy named Scott Sternberg. Who is that and what the hell does he have to do with Virgil Abloh anyway? Well, he makes sweatpants. He runs a whole company, a leisurewear company built around them called Entire World. 
And that company has been doing so well during the pandemic that they got a whole New York Times article about them called Sweatpants Forever. Sternberg is very much outside the high fashion world that Virgil moves in, but he was at one point very much within it. He used to run the fashion company Band of Outsiders. If you remember the whole skinny black tie suit vibe that came out, you know, a decade or so ago, that was like all Sternberg. Anyway, the Times actually interviewed Virgil for this article, and when they brought up Sternberg's name, his eyes lit up and he said, oh, I love Band of Outsiders. So not only did he remember the name of this guy who hasn't been relevant in fashion for ages, but he also was immediately able to place that guy's name with the brand he ran, one that also has been totally irrelevant for a long time. I guarantee that if they had continued that conversation with Virgil, he could have brought up specific pieces and collections made by the guy. All of this is to say, Virgil knows what's going on in fashion, both currently and historically. He's seen Walter Van Berendonck's collections, and he's well aware of what Kirby creates with Pierre Moss. If you could, like, pull a minority report and see inside Virgil's mind, those inspirations would be there loud and clear he would have nowhere to hide. But here's the flip side to Virgil being the smartest guy in the room. He knows how to play things. It's no coincidence that he pulls out the denials in the situations where admitting it would lead to financial loss or even lawsuits. In the instances where he has more legal cover, he seems much more willing to admit his influences even though he never actually apologizes for them. So when you consider that, you can see that there is an aspect of commerce here. I mean, the dude's not doing all of this for charity, as I'm sure his bank account would attest. And that's where things get sticky. You know, Virgil can name check Duchamp and postmodernism all he wants, but at the end of the day, he's making a lot of money off of this theft. Those name checks would only fully work if he were doing it just for the sake of the art. But he's making money, and I'm sure if you were to press him on this, he'd feel that he has a right to get his paper. That's hard to argue with, but going down that road makes it harder to defend. Because the people he copies also have a right to make a living off of the designs they create. Now that we're talking like capitalists and not artists, let's go full out and look at this from the Econ 101 perspective, supply and demand. If an artist creates something, they have control over the supply, and they can sell as much of it as the demand allows them to. But if Virgil comes along and creates a copy of that artist's work, now both Virgil and that artist are creating supply. That alone will split the demand between the two sellers. But now, let's say Virgil has a lot more hype and reach than the original artist. In that situation, and let's be real, that's the case in literally all of these allegations, Virgil is likely to siphon off just about all of that demand for himself. Of course, this is the kind of thing our society has already thought of, hence the idea of copyrights. But it's clear that that is something that Virgil doesn't hold in very high regard. And that's not like a knock on the guy, he literally uses ironic copyrights in his work all the time. But again, that's just the traditional economics argument to this, and we're not like simple capitalist pigs here, right? We gotta look at all the angles of this thing. Let's look at the most recent controversy, and the one that's probably created the most stir, which is the Walter Van Berendonck scandal. This one took the path that pretty much all drama cycles do. At first, people were just really happy to see somebody powerful like Virgil getting taken down a peg. I'll admit, I was one of them. I made a whole video about it, and I do stand by what I said in that video, but I guess this is kind of my opportunity to flesh out my full thoughts, because those are really more my, my quick takes on the subject. Anyway, people were up in arms, and then there was a re-examination of the subject, you know, questioning whether Virgil actually did anything wrong, even turning the anger at Walter for his faults, and God does he have them, but I also don't see how they're relevant in this exact situation. Anyway, in the backlash to the backlash, Heist Nabidi put out a pretty well-received article called, If You Thought Virgil Abloh Was Original, Then You Really Don't Get It. The article itself is broken down into six separate points, each of which is trying to excuse or explain away Virgil's theft in some way. So let's have some fun and look at these point by point. One, old school fashion people have always vehemently disliked Virgil Abloh. This one is a pretty clear framing trying to argue that this is a hit job by the fashion elites. 
This is inarguably true, or at least has been in the past. But cutting against that argument is the fact that he's the fucking creative director for Louis Vuitton. That's kind of as elite as it gets. That being said, there are definitely some white European people in power who really savor this opportunity to take Virgil down a peg. Two, the dislike is probably definitely racial. This is the point I actually agree with the least. And look, I get it. The white guy doesn't see this as a racial issue. I know, I know. I will absolutely admit that much of the resistance to Virgil from the top has come from a racist place. But I honestly don't see where that comes into play in this particular instance. If you're gonna make a claim like that, you have to have at least some evidence and the writer provides none. Of course, systemic racism is certainly a part of fashion as it is in pretty much every aspect of Western society. Virgil has been the recipient of some really gnarly racist attacks to be sure, but the implication that this is a concerted effort by full-blown racists to undermine him is a stretch. I mean, the subject may have been signal boosted by racists, but they are not the ones who started it. Three, this kind of hit job has happened before. This one is undeniable. I mean, we spent the entire first part of the video going over all the other times it's happened. But just because something's happened before doesn't mean it's not a valid criticism. This is gonna sound like an incendiary comparison and I am in no way equating the two or saying they are similar, but just to contextualize and take it to the extreme. Imagine if another accuser of Harvey Weinstein came out and there was some journalist out there saying, oh, enough with these allegations, won't you just go away? No, that would never happen, that would be absurd. So just because people have called Virgil an idea thief in the past doesn't somehow make it less true when it's said again. I mean, in most cases, I feel like that would make it more true because it's just more evidence, right? Four, Virgil Abloh is an original. This is really the crux of the piece and by far the most interesting to dissect. Most of the points so far have been pretty clickbaity, but this one does have some real depth. Now keep in mind, this point was made as a defense of Virgil. How the hell does that work? Well, I think what the writer is trying to say is that Virgil's whole design language is based entirely around that Duchamp-inspired idea that he takes ideas from the zeitgeist and makes them his own. This does actually make sense to me. You know, I don't think it's defensible to say that Virgil doesn't steal ideas. He clearly does. The question is, does he do so in a way that's fair, that adds to the idea, and that's imbued with his own creativity? That's the real question. Five, it doesn't matter if Virgil Abloh copied Walter Van Berendonck. The writer really doesn't back up this point, but I can think of a few defenses of it myself. First goes to the point before, that Virgil does copy others, but that that is a valid postmodern artistic process. The other argument I've heard is that Walter himself is a kind of racist designer. That sounds pretty aggressive, but the argument is this, Walter himself has admitted that he takes his design inspiration from like tribes in Africa and island nations, pretty much all of whom are people of color. By some people's viewpoint, that means that Walter is stealing ideas that don't belong to him, ideas from a culture that he doesn't belong to and that he can never fully understand. In this way, Walter is twisting those ideas and actually debasing them. For this reason, some people feel it's totally fine then that Virgil steals Walter's ideas. I agree that Walter's process is fairly ugly and I don't like it, but I don't see how that makes it okay for another artist to steal from him. Six, this isn't a legal issue. This one is kind of a side note. Apparently the writer had been seeing talk that what Virgil did was somehow illegal. And he's right, there's nothing illegal here. I mean, in cases like the Pop Smoke cover, that artist may have had a case, but in the Van Berendonck situation, it is all above board and legal, but legal does not necessarily equal ethical. So the reason for this is that clothing silhouettes like t-shirts, hoodies, button downs, whatever it may be, are not protected designs under the law because they're considered functional. And that idea gets kind of crazy once you consider the insane haute couture dresses that clearly are art, but that's a story for another episode. So that was a lot of breakdown for one article, and you can see that I'm pretty skeptical to most of the arguments attempting to defend Virgil. I find most of them to be attempts at obfuscation that really don't hold up to scrutiny in any way. 
Does that mean I think Virgil is a dirty thief? Actually, you might be surprised. The one argument I do sympathize with actually might be the only one that really matters here. Virgil takes ideas because they speak to him and they spark his creativity. In college, one of my core areas of study was literary theory, and more specifically, postmodern theory. One of the core tenets there is that art doesn't really have any meaning until somebody sees it and decides what that meaning is. In this theory, it doesn't matter what the artist's intent was. The only thing that does matter is the audience interpretation of it. And even more than that, the audience are the ones who actually own a work, not the artist. Virgil clearly believes in theories like this considering his oft-cited inspirations. So when Virgil sees something, it means something to him. In his mind, what it means to him is completely different from what it means to somebody else, and that, in a way, makes it his. And I know this is a really hard idea to accept, especially in modern society where materialism and therefore the idea of ownership itself really reigns supreme. And it's also a really convenient theory for a designer who needs to pump out product for two labels simultaneously, one of which he creates both menswear and womenswear for. However, if you've ever heard Virgil speak, he comes back to these ideas constantly. It's not just a line he brings up when he needs to defend himself from accusations of theft. Consider his famous 3% rule. And for those of you who are unfamiliar with this, he says that a work can be changed just 3% from its inspiration to make it completely new and stand on its own. In a postmodern theoretical sense, Virgil's own creativity can be said to contribute to that 3%. Another idea that people often overlook is the fact that Virgil is also a respected DJ. Both in DJ culture and in hip hop more generally, it's widely accepted that sampling and remixing are a transformative act and are therefore acceptable. As someone who doesn't just see himself as a designer, but as a DJ, artist, architect, engineer, and so on, it's pretty clear that he takes this idea from DJing into everything else he does, and that's understandable to me. At this point, Virgil is a bona fide artist as well, with a successful exhibition at the MCA called Figures of Speech. I've got a t-shirt they released for this exhibition, and I think it actually speaks really well to the subjects we're talking about here. The print on the front has text that morphs from Virgil to Amo, love. Kind of ironic considering how many people decidedly do not love Virgil. But hey, maybe that's why the quotation marks are there. The back of the shirt is adorned with an orange Ablo label. And what I love about that is that it reminds me of the little label maker tags that people put inside their own clothes in case they get lost or mixed up or whatever. It gives the impression that the shirt itself is up for interpretation, but then it's the tag that makes it decidedly Virgil's. So I've presented a lot of ideas, a lot of different viewpoints here. I did my best not to decide definitively on any single interpretation because even I'm still working this stuff out in my mind. It's heady stuff, it's tough to get your head around. It's art versus commerce, modernism versus postmodernism. It's a bunch of emotions and opinions and biases all rolled into one really sticky situation. With that, I wanna know what you think. Does Virgil have a right to design in the way that he does? Is there merit to his methods or to others' hatred of him? Leave a comment down below and let's talk it out. And with that, I want to thank you for watching. Take a look at the other video on screen here, subscribe to my channel, like this video, and I'll see you next time.